¿Qué hora el aire? ¿Qué hora? ¿Qué hora? Oh, I'm just going to close that off because I've got a gazillion screen, screens open. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much for um, taking some time to join me for this afternoon's chit chat. Really, really looking forward to sharing some of the insights um, in regards to our literacy trial journey. Um, it's my pleasure to be joined this afternoon by Fiona Wilder, who is the consultancy manager here at Learning Matters. Uh, Fiona was also one of the uh, consultants who worked with the Learning Matters team um, through the trial last year, coupled with Ruth Blair, who is not with us this afternoon. She's out there somewhere else in the wild, um, uh, working hard to shift the dial. So thank you, Fee, for giving up some time this afternoon to be able to, um, to join us. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. I'd also just like to take a moment to introduce uh, Esme um, and also Jill. So Esme, please help me if I don't pronounce your surname correctly. Esme Elias Tito. Perfect. Thank you. So um, Esme is a deputy principal and then coach. Um, she's an experienced educator with over 28 years of expertise in the field of education. Throughout Esme's career, she has held various significant roles, such as Head of Department Guidance and Counselling, Secondary School Guidance Counsellor, RTLB and Intervention Teacher. And currently, Esme is pursuing um, her PhD studies and um, further deepening her knowledge and contribution to the advancement of education. And you're specifically focusing on this area of structured literacy, yeah? Yeah, that's right. So thanks for joining us um, this afternoon, Esme. Your insights are going to be really, really valuable. And we also have Jill. Jill has over 30 years of experience in primary education and is dedicated to enhancing learning outcomes for all learners throughout her career. She's held various roles, including syndicate team leader, assistant principal, deputy principal, and literacy leader. Jill's deep-rooted passion for literacy is evident in her commitment to fostering a love for learning and supporting the growth of students in their literacy skills. So thank you also, Jill, for joining us. Um, and you actually join us a fair bit now because you've become part of our team. So we feel like we've, we're, we're pretty fortunate to have you um, as part of our team. So both of these ladies today, are, um, I'm not quite sure where you are this afternoon, Jill, but Esme, you're in Wellington? <laughs> yeah, Wellington, correct, yeah. And Jill's beaming in from Christchurch, awesome. Okay, so this afternoon's chit chat is structured slightly differently from other chit chats have been. Uh, I'm just going to work to share my screen and I have a wee PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to take everybody through who is joining us for the chit chat. And then we're going to move into a little bit of Q&A with these um, three ladies, and then we'll look to um, monitor those questions as they come in through the comment thread as well, Fee. So um, ladies, if I could have you help me with, have I got my screen sharing going on? Yep, that's working. Fantastic. So the purpose of the trial that Learning Matters participated in last year um, was to provide an evidence-based literacy and communication support package for year two to eight students with tier two and three learning needs. The package that the Ministry of Education were looking for was to include age-appropriate resources combined with one or all of the following. They wanted it to be um, direct learner support. Uh, they wanted to um, have uh, teaching approaches trialed and part of that package would include professional development. Key features were to include support packages for students um, in years two to eight who were requiring tier two and three support uh, and required targeted or individual support because they had not experienced explicit teaching of coding or code-based instruction and skills, or they were presenting or had challenges that impact their progress and access to wider literacy learning. 
The package or the teaching approach was to be diagnostic, explicit, systematic, and cumulative. And um, the packages have been independently evaluated by an external research company. So Learning Matters provided two, and in some cases, three participants or teachers from each kura or school with the knowledge, skills, and processes to put into practice the ideal intervention teaching approach for their selected trial groups in years four to six in tier two and tier three intervention. I mentioned on the previous slide that the trial was uh, looking across years two to eight. Learning Matters was one of three providers um, who were um, successfully procured to take part in this literacy trial. Um, we were able to select which um, age ranges and year levels that we were going to trial. So we chose to trial um, our ideal intervention approach in years four to six. The trial involved a combination of professional development via professional learning or PLD modules, um, observations of teaching and spelling and reading, via both face-to-face -face and remote coaching um, sessions. Um, it also in involved a diagnostic, systematic and cumulative teaching approach, and it also involved a suite of comprehensive resources. This trial and all qualitative and quantitative data was given to an independent research company. Um, their job was to then provide an independent um, research report back to the Ministry of Education on um, uh, compiling the progress during and the final outcomes of the trial. Just getting my mouse in the right place. The trial sample um, that Learning Matters worked with included a total of 432 students. Those 432 students came from 15 schools across Aotearoa. Nearly 50-50 of the students were male and female. And you can see um, in the pie, um, chart to the right-hand side, the distribution across years four, five, and six. The ethnic representation across this range or this demographic was that 58% of students were European. 22% uh, were Māori, 4% Samoan, 2% Fijian, and 14% represented through other ethnicities. You can see on this slide when certain aspects took place across the course of the trial. So straight away you can see the trial took place um, across three terms. Uh, it was a very, very quick turnaround um, in terms of um, being um, made aware that, that we had been successful with the literacy trial to actually getting on board, getting schools on board. Um, and that's because the trial had a deadline of being finished um, in term, at the end of term four. So um, as part of this quick turnaround, we were really determined to get 20 weeks of teaching in. So we worked incredibly hard to make this happen and the schools and the leaders that we worked with were absolutely amazing at getting um, the necessary things in place to, to bring that on board. Uh, we started with a five-day face-to-face intervention training and this was broken up into two blocks, a three-day block and then a two-day block after assessments had been administered. This slide shows what the module focuses were for the first three days of training. And uh, the teachers involved, a lovely snapshot of you, Esme and Jill. Um, the teachers involved uh, engaged really, really well with the content. I think it'd be, fair, it'd be fair to say, ladies, that it was a little bit of um, information overload at times, um, but they were um, eager to learn and very, very committed. The first three days of um, professional learning and development set the intervention teachers up to be able to go back to their schools and assess their students. And um, you can see from the three steps bullet pointed on the slide that this was what was involved um, in the process um, as the Learning Matters Ideal Approach Trial. Uh, we also had control groups in our trial. So 
we therefore had trial teachers complete universal screening of all year four to six Aukonga. And the findings were astounding with, in some cases, 85% of students in year four to six falling within our tier two and three indicators. Um, this data was then used to identify the tier two and tier, and tier three Aukonga and we then worked with um, the trial teachers to narrow that down even more so because honestly the, the, the size of the numbers and the significance in terms of the um, amount of students that were presenting as tier two and three learners was, was um, pretty um, astounding really. So assessments administered included those that you can see on the screen. Uh, we used the ideal spelling assessments. Um, this was administered for step one for the universal screening of students. Um, once students were allocated into a control or trial group for tier two or three, further assessment, further diagnostic assessment took place. And that further diagnostic assessment included the ideal foundation literacy skills, the reading skills record, the phonic book placement, and the adapted Bryant was also used as a common assessment tool across all three providers to measure um, decoding um, ability pre-trial, um, partway through the trial, and then um, post-trial as well. So once the assessment and allocation process was complete, it was time to bring the teachers back to learn more about the what and how to teach these students. We knew it was important that they had specific instruction, um, in explicit instruction, and how to plan for lessons in an efficient and effective manner. The two days, the last two days, were jam-packed with activities to support this. Once these five days of face-to-face -face were completed, the teachers then were equipped mostly equipped. I don't think we could safely say that you know you can get it all in the five days, but they were really, really well equipped um, with increased knowledge, understanding and tools to be able to effectively plan and begin teaching across the intervention groups. The implementation of the intervention teaching approach saw tier two teachers teaching two groups of four students three times a week for 20 minutes. And it's important that I point out here that this was on top of the tier one regular instruction and spelling instruction using the ideal platform. Tier three teachers were fully released from the classroom for point eight or four days of the week. This crucial inclusion in our trial was strategic to provide an alternative to current intervention approaches that have a teacher released. We do believe that schools require a released specialist intervention teacher, hence this was included. The benefits for those teachers and students as a result, I think is safe to say, were incredibly significant. Tier three teachers taught six groups of peers four times per week in 30 minute sessions. Um, they taught phonological awareness, spelling and reading. And these skills and teaching focuses um, for the peers varied depending on the in, uh, identified needs of the students. Sessions for tier three student lessons were tailored depending on the diagnostic needs of the student and planning and tracking systems introduced by um, our Learning Matters team were used by these teachers weekly. What I just really want to point out here is the importance of there being alignment in tier one, tier two, and tier three. Trial teachers were provided with the necessary resources to ensure the success of the teaching approach. These included a login to the ideal online platform, additional resources to support learning and teaching. You can see. Um, on the slide, a selection of some of the resources that they received. Um, as previously mentioned, uh, there was an inclusion of a tier 3.8 teacher. This was, a, this was funded um, as part of our approach package. And um, time was spent during on-site visits, coaching sessions, and the PLD days 
on ensuring that teachers were really well supported with the effective and explicit use of these resources. We didn't want to end the trial and have these things um, sitting on um, shelves collecting dust. So we believe that um, the inclusion of coaching, modelling and observations were a key part of the implementation model throughout the trial. The intervention implementation model included three face-to-face -face sessions where the consultant modelled or observed lessons and then coached the teachers. Elements of these sessions included also teachers videoing a lesson and self-reflecting prior to the coaching session. This enabled uh, questions and conversations to be directed explicitly to their practice. Some schools actually did take it upon themselves to go and observe other teachers or schools in action and to sort of build a community of practice around the work that was happening in the trial. And um, there were also four online group coaching sessions um, for that each of the uh, facilitators took as well. Our team um, at Learning Matters who were involved in the trial were very, very fortunate to be coached throughout the trial by two legends, Professor Pamela Snow and Dr Lorraine Hammond. Uh, this image is one of our Coach the Coach um, calls with them. And during this particular session, we were focused on how to shift student outcomes and ensure fidelity of implementation. Ongoing learning and reflection is important for all of us. Uh, we discussed many aspects of intervention and implementation during our various coach calls, but I did really want to highlight some of these this afternoon. Key areas included instructional language is key. We must cut the fluff. Pace is crucial. Perky pace is crucial. Instant corrective feedback is crucial. Everyone, all students must participate uh, in the lesson, as Dr. Anita Archer would say. It's not that show of I say something, I say something, I say something, see you tomorrow. We must teach every day to see shifts or the best part of, you know, the four out of five days. We must eliminate the most conflicting practices. For example, we wouldn't teach our students to guess when reading. We wouldn't allow the use of three queuing or anything to do with three queuing because it is contradictory or in contradiction with this approach um, that we are implementing. Um, we focused on the importance of setting goals of where teachers and students need to be in a scope and sequence at the end of the term or at the end of a teaching block. And mastery really, really matters, as does success. Um, these connections made a big difference to the rigour and consistency of our own coaching sessions. And we're really, really grateful for having had that connection. Let's look at a couple of ways that we measured achievement and the shifts made. So comparable ideal spelling, whole word data was collated for 432 students, comprising 235 trial students and 197 control students across the 15 schools. This example shows uh, a stage two ideal assessment chart of term two data and term four data. Um, so the term two data is obviously the pink bars and the term for the red bars. So this is after 20 weeks of teaching for a tier three trial group who are working in stage two. And for the purpose of the data reporting, our focus has been on um, pre-trial and in-trial whole word correct data. Um, this information provides a summative assessment insight and gives an increase in um, um, indication of a student's increase in encoding ability. Uh, of course, this data will be drilled into more so um, by the research team, and they will look at this in a number of different ways. Okay. Um, this data representation shows the efficacy of this structured literacy intervention approach for the tier two, stage two, and stage three uh, konga. So if we're reading from left to right, the stage two control group in the blue 
had 22 students and the stage two trial group in the green uh, had 37 students. If we then move across to the um, image on the right hand side, the stage three control group, which is again in the blue, had 52 students and um, the trial group again in green had 55 students. We can establish from this that students in the trial group in both stages two and three started with lower mean averages than the control group. In both cases, the trial group made greater progress in their mean average gains than the control group. Oh, sorry, just get my place again. Uh, it's really important to note here um, that as teachers were teaching the tier two, they really started to observe significant progress of students in their trial group. And they came to us and asked if they could actually teach their whole class in tier one instruction this way. Um, of course, then this is likely to have an impact on the variance of data findings at the end of the trial. We consulted the Ministry of Education um, regarding this, and um, it was actually their preference that the teachers were able to teach their control group as well using the ideal approach. Um, as well as the mean average point, I really want you to take note of the top and tail end of the box and whisker. In both stages for the post test on the right hand side, compared to um, the post-test of the control groups. Sorry, I'm just bringing my mouse around. Going that way, cool. And this data representation shows the efficacy of the structured literacy intervention approach for the tier three stage two ARCOMA. So the control group, the blue on the left hand side, had 111 students and the trial group 123 students. So when we look at this data, we can establish that students in the trial group started again with a lower mean average than those in the control group and made significantly greater progress in terms of mean average gains than the control group. It's really clear to see the significant difference the explicit teaching of code-based skills made on a student's ability to spell after only 20 weeks of teaching. Further data analysis and insight um, will be shared when the Ministry release their full research report, which will include results from all providers. And we understand from the research team that the Ministry are um, hoping to publish that full report in July 2023. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. There we go. And um, we're just going to pause here for a moment to think about um, some questions um, that, and, and hear some comments from you ladies that were directly involved in the trial. So Esme, if I come to you first, and you were to take a moment to share what was the biggest um, impact for you as a teacher involved in the trial? Um, and perhaps your colleagues, I've probably got three things. What was the biggest impact for you? for your colleague, and when you think about considerations that needed to be made in relation to being culturally responsive, um, what could you share or what insights could you share? Sure. Um, looking back at this now, it's quite nice to have the hindsight to um, gather your thoughts. And so I can see that the training package that we received um, took into account two aspects, and one is that having to know the knowledge um, behind what you do, but also the other side is developing your practice. And so those two things have to work together. Uh, you can read articles and research, but then there's a whole different thing to be able to actually practice what's in that research. And so for us, the, uh, the training package really bridged that gap. Uh, it gave us knowledge, but it also gave us um, the uh, experience of how to practice uh, structured literacy and intervention. Uh, the knowledge aspect of it was um, uh, hammered homes really strongly in five days of intense um, 
PLD. And my colleague Karen said it was the most intensive and relevant PLD that she's ever experienced. And I would have had to agree that we had three days, then we went back to have a sleep because we really <laughs> need to recover from this. And then another two days, um, maybe three weeks later. Um, but the impact of that training on me particularly was the way it was delivered. Um, it was delivered in an explicit manner. So it, I don't know if you've been on training before where they deliver it different to what they say you are, what you have to teach. So we were taught that we need to be explicit, but then we were trained in an explicit manner. And so being able to observe that was, um, was a real highlight for me uh, because, you know, I learned how to retrieve information. I learned how to um, also, um, you know, look back at what review what we've just taught. Um, so for me, that was really uh, critical because I caught myself so many times um, wanting to say, what, what do you remember about, and then realizing, hang on, I haven't taught that. Why am I asking things before I've even taught it? Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, the training has aspect really helped me hone my instruction. Uh, so that was really critical for me. Um, another aspect of the training that was great was a real focus on the neurodiversity um, piece. And we became um, you know, familiar with what to look for in terms of cognitive load, in terms of dyslexia, in terms of hyperlexia. And as a SINCO, um, I remember walking away thinking that was the best uh, training that any SINCO or RTLB really needed to have. Um, I hadn't received anything like that before, but it was um, it was bigger than just um, learning how to instruct structured literacy. It was yeah. so informal, uh, informing of other things that um, I do as a SINCO in the role. Um, so yeah, it was intensive, um, but it really did impact our um, practice. So looking now from the knowledge to the practice aspect of it, um, we had a team of three at Waterloo School and we became a little lunchtime community. Like we'd want to uh, catch up and share, what did you do? How did that happen? And I remember going to visit Jesse and Karen and um, watching their practice and suddenly getting like light bulb moments of actually, <laughs> I forgot how to do that and that's really helpful. That's really helped my practice improve as well. So the practice part for me, um, particularly the coaching and the modeling aspect uh, was critical. So, you know, you can think you're doing something um, a certain way, but it's you need to hold a mirror up to what you're doing to actually see what it is that you, you know, what you are practicing. And, and so uh, one of my epiphany moments was um, when Carla came and she was uh, modeling for us. Um, we had done spelling initially and the second time she came, she came to coach and um, model the um, reading lessons. And so I had a group up and I was um, taking them through a reading lesson. And then at the end of that reading lesson, I said, Carla, I've noticed, and the kids were right there. Um, I noticed that we're saying stoppered um, or jumpered at the end of our EDs uh, endings. Mm -hmm. I said, how do we deal with this here? And um, Carla jumped in. And so in this reading lesson, she jumped in and started modeling aspects of the spelling lesson and um, flicked up the words and then got whiteboards out. And we divided our, our whiteboards into the three sounds of ED. And mini spelling lesson happened within that reading lesson. And for me, that was critical. That was my aha moment to realize you, you could think that this was a program, but it's not, it's a pedagogy. And that aha moment for me was um, how, if my knowledge is up to par and I feel confident, I can then integrate everything I know from spelling and reading and writing together. Yes. And I can, I can do it um, as it comes up as well as explicitly and implicitly too. And so that lesson for me was my aha moment of seeing it as a pedagogy and realizing that I now had the confidence to bridge the gap between, mm -hmm. um, you know, between this yeah. kind of prescriptive way that some people might think it is, but I see mm -hmm. it as a highly scaffolded way that grows your confidence so that you can flip in and out where you need to, depending on the needs of the students right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying that, Esme, too, I really think that we have to understand that this is not only such a big shift in practice for us in terms of our everyday tier one instruction, it's even on a greater steroid version when we think about particularly our tier three instruction, right? And so 
if we don't have those supports around us to um, bounce off, to ref, you know help us reflect through a coaching conversation, we will likely develop practice that is not going to shift the dial for some students. Because just like for when students are learning, for us when we're learning to teach this explicit way, practice makes permanent. So that example you gave about me being able to step in and help you see how spelling comes into reading, and it sounds very simple, but we've got to have the knowledge of the concept. We've got to know exactly how we would bring it in, which builds mm -hmm. over time. Um, yeah, I think that's a really great example for thinking about that. But I'm just going to switch to you because I know we've had a conversation around exactly what we're talking about here. And I think you saw some of this with the teachers that you were coaching as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the What I observed through the um, with the schools and the teachers that I was working in was that um, very much at the start, as they were beginning, it was sort of what they were sort of sticking to um, a very direct um, straight line roadmap, I guess. But as their knowledge and understanding grew, and they could see, you know, what was sitting across from, the, from them in terms of what the students were doing, they were actually. Um, really being responsive to the needs of the students and mm -hmm. um, their planning and their teaching reflected that. And that was, a, as you said, Esme, how, um, you know, through a combination of building their knowledge, their understanding of the why, but then their understanding of how to teach explicitly. And so um, one of the, um, well, a lot of comments that came back from teachers was that this trial, this intervention trial, gave them the tools to teach um, strategically for those students that sit mm. across and adapt their teaching and practice for that, which, um, you know, in a 20-week trial was a massive, mm. massive shift for teachers. Mm. I mean, we, we did it fast-paced, but, you know, man, we saw some pretty amazing practice happening. Mm. I great. totally dedicated practitioners who were ready and chomping at the bit to learn, right? Absolutely. Jill, if we come to you and you think about um, the impact the trial had in your setting on your students and your wider Fano community, how would you respond to that? Well, I guess the, on the students, the, the biggest impact was on their learning. I mean, you can see that in the data, the, the massive shift that the students made and you know, we had students coming into this intervention who had some pretty well-practiced, inefficient strategies for decoding and encoding, um, which, you know, largely had them take their eyes away from the text. Mm -hmm. and, and then suddenly to, well, not suddenly, but over time to gain all that knowledge around, you know, letter-sound relationships and syllables and, um, and their ability to... Um, you know, isolate sounds and blend sounds. And as they grew that knowledge and those skills, they realized actually they didn't need to guess. They could um, they could actually yeah. read. They actually mm. knew how to um, decode a word or, ha or how to go about trying to spell a word. So that was hugely impacting because that was empowering for them. They realized that I actually I'm reading. I'm not just fluffing my way through this and and guessing and and it took a while because you know um that they, they were well practiced at, yeah. at these inefficient <laughs> strategies and, yeah. and it was covering up for their for their inadequacy to yeah so um but that was really empowering for them just the the knowledge and the skills that they were building and then along with that of course as a result of that was the huge shift in their attitude um, you know, I had kids at the beginning of the of the trial that had been in so many interventions. They were year five and sixes. They didn't want mm. to come and work in an intervention yeah. group with me again. They'd been there, done that. They'd rather not be singled out and rather rather stay in their class. But it didn't take very long before they started to realise that this was working for them, and and um, they were feeling pretty good about this. And they knew, know that this was making a difference. 
we had talked about the brain. We had our brain picture up in our in our um, little room. Um, they knew what was happening in in the brain when they were learning to read and why we were doing this. Um, and so their whole attitude changed. And they used to um, come up to me in the playground if I hadn't had them before morning tea and say, "When are you getting me? Don't mm -hmm. you get me today?" <laughs> which was which was pretty awesome. And along with their attitude shift, of course, came their um, confidence shift. And that was that was a major impact. Um, their confidence when they worked with me, um, just their participation um, in the session, their eagerness to be there, their, their, their wanting to do things like time themselves, reading their words, you know, which at first they were, you know, not, not too happy about. Mm -hmm. um, their confidence back in the classroom, teachers said that they just saw that confidence you know rocket they were participating and contributing they were teaching the other kids what they were learning and yeah in their interventions they were like I, re I think that was a real common um that was a really commonly said um yeah. kind of piece of qualitative feedback would you agree Fee, about how students Absolutely. would go back into the classroom and actually start teaching their kids and yeah. uh, start teaching the other kids and then as those particularly those um the tier two teachers started to pick up more, got you know, dipping into tier one, that just happened more and more so. Yeah. And, and then they're also their confidence actually outside of school, because when I talked to some of their parents, they said that they saw a change in their confidence in other areas. Like, wow. like one one parent commented that that their daughter was was dancing with a lot more confidence because she felt better about herself. She didn't mm. feel like like she was she she was the the struggler anymore um and um of course some behavior changes impacted on behaviors because some children who who had a few um you know issues with some behaviors mm. suddenly they felt better about themselves and and their behavior had improved both at home and in the classroom yeah that's amazing at, for, for the whanau i mean we got them engaged pretty pretty early and they were well on board um, and very enthusiastic. We we invited them. I invited them into my intervention to watch a session, mm -hmm. um, and they were amazed. They were amazed that in half an hour, those kids had done so much work. You know, mm -hmm. with it being really explicit and perky paced. Yeah, I was going to say, and, so you had your pace, did you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, lots of particip participation from the from the kids. The parents were were pretty amazed. And some of those parents, the really um, interesting thing was that, you know, some of those parents were dyslexic themselves. Yeah. Or yeah. other members of their, of their whanau who were dyslexic. And so to them, I remember one parent sitting there and saying, this just makes so much sense. Mm. And gosh, I wish it was around when I learned to read and write. Um, yeah. So, and, and for the whanau, um, um, they also saw that shift in attitude, of course, with their kids. I, I had a parent who said to me for the first time in six years of schooling, their son actually wanted to come to school because he wow. didn't feel like he was the, the dummy in the class anymore. And um, that, that, was, that was pretty amazing. Um, pretty heartwarming yeah. when you hear stories like that. That's why yeah. we do this, yeah. right? Oh, to, absolutely. To fundamentally it, make a difference. Yeah. It was probably one of the most... Um, rewarding positions I've held in all my years of teaching actually in all my different positions seeing those shifts and seeing that change in attitude and confidence and and seeing the parents gratefulness um, mm. was probably one of the most rewarding things I had done um, and the parents at the end of the year were writing to the board of trustees they were very concerned um, that it may not continue. And so several wrote to the Board of Trustees, you know, pleading mm. that it continue. And I also got some some offers for some private tutoring. They were so, um, you know, they knew it was working. They wanted yeah. it to continue. Yeah. Mm. That's awesome. Well yeah. done. Um, Esme, when you think about, you know, the difference that it made, I can see some of the students that you had in your group and um and also some of the students in GC and Karen's group. You know, you you do have a culturally diverse setting at Waterloo. When you think about the difference for those students who present um, as Māori and Pacifica or um, other ethnicities, how would you describe the difference um, 
for those students? You know, did, do you think that the way we delivered the intervention sessions was culturally appropriate? Were we able to engage those students from different ethnic backgrounds? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately, and um, I think I've landed in a place where um, underpinning everything we do is cultural responsiveness. And you know, equity is in the, the middle of all of that. Mm. And then layered upon that for me is um, evidence-based practice, which is structured literacy. The two go together. So having read the research on um, structured literacy uh, and everything I know about structured literacy, it's all about equity. Um, the turning point for me was reading the, um, the Chapman report from Massey University. And it really highlighted uh, the impact, the significant impact um, literacy, the evidence-based literacy had on Pacifica, on Māori students, on low socioeconomic students, DSL-1, uh, to the point that they were catching up with their counterparts. And so mm -hmm. that for me, that was my epiphany point of um, this works in New Zealand as well as the rest of the world. And so it's time to take this on and to really um, investigate what this looks like in practice. So I knew that um, when we chose our students, we chose them really carefully because, as you know, we had too many to choose from, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but I chose, you know, we chose kids that we knew were about to leave our school, but also may not ever get a chance like this mm -hmm. again. Um, and there was a sense of urgency because we yeah. had 16 weeks, 18 weeks to really push it with those kids. And uh, we, we had intention that we wanted to shift the dial for those students. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say that um, cultural, everything you've learned about cultural responsiveness, you bring into the room. You don't leave it at the, at the door. Mm -hmm. You bring it into the room and it's who you are. Um, and we all know that the teacher is the one that can make the most impact on change. And so you bring that into the room and you relate to your students in the beautiful way that you, you do. Um, and then your evidence-based instruction works wonders because you've used the two together. Mm. And just before I sort of switch across to you, Fee, I also want to say that, you know, probably one of my key takeaways um, or affirmations, I guess you'd say, is that absolutely for me um, in reflecting on the trial, we definitely can say that the biggest resource is the teacher. The biggest resource is the person delivering the intervention. What we did in, and what we do in our ideal approach and with all of the resources and the coaching that we provide is we do that in a way that wraps support around and helps to grow and flourish the ability of that individual teacher. Um, it's definitely not a program that's set to replace a teacher. It's actually all about coming from that place of building pedagogy and helping that teacher to be the very best they can be as they sit across from those um, mm. learners who, who have not necessarily experienced great success. So, B, if I say to you, um, you know, what was it that you noticed or that your teachers said made the biggest difference um, in terms of shifting the dial for, for them and or for their students, what, what would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, there was a huge amount of feedback that we got, not just from the schools I worked in, but across all of our schools. And we actually gathered that, um, that data and that feedback through our um, ongoing conversations and then we also did um, trial surveys as well so we gathered um, a lot of feedback which is really good. I think first and foremost as we've alluded to and said um, the five days of PLD training um, yes it was um, intense um, and it was it's intense um, at our end too eh? <laughs> it was intense it was very intense it was intense all around however we um, really did take the teachers from the understanding of the why and then mm -hmm. systematically took them through to the how, how to deliver this, how to implement it. And when they left that those five days, we then carried on our support of these teachers. We modelled um, the explicit lessons in spelling and reading. We mo modelled different strategies for them. We modelled how to use the resources. So we 
provided a lot of explicit instruction from um you know you um myself and Ruth um to our consultancy to uh, sorry to our um trial teachers um and then there were ongoing observations so we came back each term uh, and we observed teachers and then we coached them through how to um to support their practice moving forward um and teachers also videoed themselves uh teaching as well which i think was um really beneficial mm -hmm. as you i think you said Esme, it's that mirror of um of of what your teaching looks like the ideal platform was a really big um support for all teachers and I think that was really right across all of our 15 schools from the resources uh, to the lesson plans the instructional videos the assessments um, being able to input data and generate reports um, to give you that really good diagnostic information um, and also to monitor the progress of your students um, I think what it gave the teachers was the ability to begin teaching with confidence. Mm. They didn't have to, uh, um, for want of a better term, fluff around trying to sort of pull mm -hmm. everything together. They could just go and teach, which was exactly what we wanted them to do yeah. and yeah. what they wanted mm -hmm. to do with confidence. Um. The scope and sequence, that was another big um, takeaway because a lot of these teachers had come into this with um, having not taught using a scope and sequence before. Mm. So the scope and sequence they taught through was very systematic and very cumulative and it really gave them that clear roadmap of where they were and where they were um, heading to. Can, um, I just, can I just pick up on something there because I think there'll be people who are listening in you know and thinking about scope and sequence so we we know right that there is no one set scope and sequence um that is sort of you know necessarily better than another but what I think is really really important to table through this intervention chit chat is that the tighter the scope and sequence and intervention the better so what I mean by that is the slower and the more systematic the scope and sequence the better because if your scope and sequence has less elements, components, concepts to it, if students don't get it, you don't have anywhere to fold back in the scope. So you want your scope and sequence for intervention to be very, very comprehensive and have as many concepts for teaching as possible because as Jody Clements, who trained me and trains many, many people across our te and now at NSL would say, Go as fast as you can, but as slow as you must. It's very difficult to go slow if your scope and sequence has very, it is very broad and doesn't have all the nitty gritty that's needed. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think the other um, thing that we did really well with the intervention teachers, and this was the feedback that we got, was that we uh, guided them very well through an intervention structure for the lesson. Mm -hmm. So it was not just a spelling or a reading lesson. There were different components mm. within there. And as, as I said earlier, as the teachers became more confident with their knowledge and understanding and their practice, they could see how they had to adapt that, that lesson sequence for the students that sit across from them. Mm. Um, because what we know in intervention, it's um, it's much more intense and you need mm. to be more responsive uh, and, uh, and, and look at it in a different lens to what is actually happening um, in, in the classroom. So really what you're alluding to there, Fee, is the importance to kind of spotlight the quality of the intervention whatever intervention is happening in place in different schools across um, Aotearoa is actually the quality of the intervention teaching is what needs to be under scrutiny. 
Um, I know I mentioned before we came on this chit chat that I'm experiencing lots of comments from different parts of the country where people are like, yeah, we use Dakota balls in our intervention setting. And I kind of say, well, what do you do? Like, actually, how deep do you go? Do you have a good quality set of diagnostics? And it's all about the knowledge and capability and explicit instruction of that teacher, right? I can Absolutely. see you nodding your head, Esme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Absolutely. And, uh, and I mean, we, all three of us observed that knowledge and growth mm. in our teachers as we, as we went mm. through. Um, I think um, from, the, from very early on in the trial, the feedback I got from my trial teachers, and I know, um, you know, Ruth got it from some of hers, and I know you did from yours as well, Carla, was that um, they were saying straight away, we need this in tier one instruction we need mm. why is this not across the board we need this they could see how good it was mm. from the outset and um from you know at the end of the trial we had 15 schools and all of those schools have carried on using the ideal platform in 2024 um, and as some of them, a number of them have come on to be um, consultancy schools uh, with us this year where um, a consultant is working in to support the implementation right across the school. But I think that just shows uh, how powerful and the impact that mm. this intervention had within those schools. Which and the really desire, right, to try and get it right in that tier one instruction, I think. You know, I can see Jill and Esme, you're nodding. And, and from a leadership perspective, it's got to go. We've got to get it there. You know, yes, this ministry um, directive in the trial was about the effectiveness and the efficacy of a structured literacy intervention for tier two and three learners who are older learners. But we've also got to realise that we all, we, you know, we really have to get this instruction right at tier one and the earlier the better. Absolutely. And some of these schools have uh, carried on with the um, tier two and tier three. The schools are funding it uh, mm. themselves, which yeah, is incredible. Which is incredible. Absolutely. Absolutely incredible. incredible. So um, what I'm going to do now, switch back to my slides. I've just got a couple of key takeaways that I want to finish on. And then I'm going to come back to you ladies for your one key message to sign off. So this is going to give you a chance to think about your one key message <laughs> while I just switch back to here. Just give me one moment. Uh, here we go. So um, when we were working with teachers and working with the research team, we gathered an awful lot of um, qualitative information. Um, we asked teachers to summarise knowledge gained from participating in the trial, including how this is significantly different from their previous understanding. One participant stated that the knowledge gained about how the brain learns to read was the most important professional development they had had in 30 years of teaching. The evidence-based science of reading, simple view and the reading rope are constant influences on the teaching and learning that this person had undertaken with their learners. And also the explicit teaching combined with I do, we do, you do, um, had a really, really big impact on this particular teacher. Um, the conscious effort not to ask questions during explicit teaching, which uh, Esme was referring to earlier, took away the guesswork and anxiety with the learners. And this was a really big shift in practice, not just for this teacher, but for many, many of the teachers that we had the privilege of working alongside on the trial. So what were the key takeaways and what were the recommendations that we sent through to the Ministry of Education? Number one is personnel. Tier three teachers should be allocated and funded in these positions to ensure continuity. Staffing allocation should be carefully planned to support tier three teachers. Uh, teacher knowledge is crucial. Initial training should be followed by ongoing learning. Um, consistency in teaching approaches should be developed by training the entire teaching staff across schools. We don't want this sort of hit and miss going forward. We want some policy direction around 
alignment of um, building knowledge. Assessment, um, we look forward to the opportunity of schools having a range of diagnostic tools that will guide teaching and learning. Um, maybe in the future, we'll have some standardized summative assessment tools um, for benchmarking, to measure achievement, and also for caring students. Wouldn't it be amazing if New Zealand had um, a moderated benchmark system for tiering students instead of a tier three student at Waterloo presenting different from a tier three student at Plymouth, for example. Uh, in terms of the teaching approach, um, a consistent lesson sequence or in some guidelines around what um, a quality lesson sequence looks like um, should serve as a baseline for instruction. Uh, this is the case not only when we think about um, uh, Ministry of Education considerations, but for those of you that are in intervention or school leaders, what does your instruction look like across Tier 1, Tier 2 and Tier 3? Teaching in Tier 2 and 3 should become more scaffolded based on students' needs. Teaching materials should be easily accessible to all stakeholders across the tiers. And this is not just for intervention purposes. Teachers don't have time to stand at laminating machines. In fact, teachers are far too valuable in terms of their cost um, to be standing at laminators, cutting things out, photocopying fiercely. Uh, we want teachers to be able to be in the position where they can get on with the job of teaching and learning. In many cases throughout the trial, we had school leaders observing teaching in action and having regular conversations with their teachers. Um, we believe that it would be great to have, um, uh, in addition to the modules, for example, that we provided, it would be great to have some modules for um, school leaders so that they can understand implications for them moving forward. Collaboration is key. Schools should have more than one champion supporting the approach. Regional champions might be um, a ministerial consideration or a policy direction consideration, where regional champions um, through Kahoyako could be positioned as experts to develop um, and deliver the model with accountability and support. Coaching is crucial. And if we can create um, an on mass situation through that collaboration um, and some community work, that would be fantastic. It's really important to know that a coaching framework is necessary to ensure that consistency occurs. Um, I can see the other ladies nodding. Um, this is an area that we work really extensively in is the building of coaching frameworks to ensure quality conversations occur in a way that shifts practice, that doesn't um, do anything other than that. Minimum teaching time is crucial across all of those tiers, um, but clear expectations regarding minimum teaching time really should be established. And finally, school readiness. You know, I think it's safe to say that across the trial, we worked with some schools that were really, truly ready for this. And we worked with some schools that really, truly weren't ready for this and required some more support. And I'm just thinking, Esme, in terms of the work that you're doing and around your study, that's probably a really interesting consideration um, to be thinking about as well, because you know, um, for all of us across the space of structured literacy, both in intervention and in tier one instruction, we need to be thinking about what it means to be ready to create the shift in our schools and, um, and, and what we might need to um, remove or, or, I don't know if this is the right term, but I want to say de-implement. There's probably a better term than that, but, um, you know, we need to plan around what we're actually going to be removing from our practice. So where to from here? Um, as a team, we've reflected on the approach that we implemented throughout the trial. We've now updated and recrafted the process documents for our ideal users. Um, for those of you who are ideal users, these will be available to you in the coming week or so. We're about to open um, an intervention part of our leadership area on the ideal platform. We'll be um, adding to the ideal platform the following process documents or bringing them in line with interventions. So a lot of these documents are there already, but uh, 
uh, reading and spelling guidelines for reporting and measuring progress, curriculum alignment guidelines. I know there's a bit of work going on behind the scenes with our team to just continuously update that one. Um, learning support allocation documents. So how do we know who should be a tier two and who should be a tier three? And then an outline of the intervention process for tier two and tier three learners. So ladies, a final word. Bill. Well, I mean, I've been a classroom teacher for many, many years and, a, and an interve intervention teacher through lots of different sorts of interventions, but I've never really felt that I've been able to reach all my learners, particularly my dyslexic learners. And that's something that's been a huge disappointment. But I feel now that I have the knowledge and the understanding where I can help all my learners. And I just want every teacher in New Zealand to have that knowledge and understanding too. Thank you. Uh, Fiona. Um, so I've actually got some questions really to for people to consider but um the first one would be um in your school how how is your school aligning tier one tier two and tier three mm -hmm. great and question does intervention in your school um is it does it align with what the science and research tells us and if there are multiple interventions in your school, are they serving the purpose for um, intended for your students? So I guess really my um, my biggest question is and something for leadership, um, Senko, um, literacy leads in the school to go away and reflect on what they are doing and is it aligning? Um, and is it best practice within your school setting? Mm. Cool, thank you. Yes, May. Well, Fiona, perfect lead in. Um, my, <laughs> my thinking <laughs> is about school leadership, and that's what I really want to um, leave with. Um, this is such a huge pedagogical shift mm. uh, in, in the years that I've been teaching, is probably the biggest one that I've had to. Um, implement myself but also watching my staff and how massive it is for them as well so I think it's really critical to have strategic leadership and to really think through how you're going to implement this tier one two and three um, it is a marathon it's not a sprint and so you really need to be considered about um, the strategy of how you're going to do this uh, but you want to bring everyone with you and um you want to look after your people and be kind as, at the yes. same time as doing this. So building your in-house expertise or your champions is really critical that you have that knowledge within your school. Um, so investing in uh, people's expertise, whether it's practice and knowledge, um, is going to be your long-term uh, game that you've got someone there who can carry you through as well as having your PLD provider. You've got people on the ground who mm. can keep you going for the long term. So yeah, my, my parting thoughts is strategic leadership is critical to this. Mm, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, ladies. It's been really great to hear um, to hear your insights. And um, I actually just want to have a shout out too to all of the other teachers and leaders who were involved in our literacy trial last year. It was an incredible privilege for our team to work alongside such a dedicated group and groups of uh, teachers um, in the three regions that we that we worked across. And we are sharing this information and raising the conversation this afternoon in a bid to do exactly what you've just done, Fee, in terms of raising those questions. So thank you for raising those questions. Thank you, Jill and Esme, for your insights. I hope that um, if nothing else, sharing this information stirs the pot a little bit more and, and gets people thinking about what is going on and um, and talks about those things, you know, talking about those things um, in greater detail. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of my um, final word or key takeaway is really the alignment of practice between tier one, tier two. 
uh, and tier three is key. And the other part for me is around knowledge is power. And I don't mean that in the sense of strength. I mean that in the strength of empowerment. Because when you have the knowledge, you are empowered. And then if you couple that with um, teaching resources and um, people who can support you and coach you along your way, then that makes a really, really big difference to shifting the dial, both for you as a teacher, but also for the students um, and whānau community that you work alongside. Thank you to everyone who's given up their time to share us share that this time with us of what's become an extended chit chat um, to help us sort of get this message out there this afternoon. Really, really thrilled to share with you all that our next chit chat is staying in the space of intervention. Uh, we have a chit chat with Elizabeth Norton, who specialises in um, uh, research and recommendations in the area of rapid uh, automatised naming, um, which we know is a really, really um, uh, key indicator in terms of um, neurodiversity, but particularly dyslexia. So have a fantastic afternoon, everyone. For our ideal users, keep an eye out in the ideal group for these things that are, um, are coming your way. But thank you so much for joining us all this afternoon. Kaki te anō.